Well, good morning, everybody. Hello to everybody at home as well. So I want to start off by giving a big thanks to, uh, to Daniel Roberts and Josh Kincaid, who preached the last two weeks. I've done this the last few years, but at the end of the summer, I like to take two weeks off to just mentally take a break and get ready for the fall. So big thanks to Daniel and Josh. Really enjoyed your messages. I, I loved the image you created for us last week, Josh, of imagining what the next chapter will look like uh, for all of us. So thank you for that. Secondly, next week, we're going to start a brand new series, and it's called Reimagine. And the idea behind that series is going to be that there's really no going backwards at this point. A lot of us might feel like, oh, I just want to, I want things to go back to the way that they were, but that's not really an option. But I do think there's a way forward, a really healthy way forward. And so we're starting a new series uh, next week to talk about what do we do now? What is the new version of, of life and relationships and church? And speaking of church, before I preach the sermon this morning, I do want to talk just a little bit about our church family. So from, from your perspective, it could be limited perspective that you have of attending parking lot service every week. Could be the limited perspective you feel like you have watching from your living room each week, but a lot of us feel like we don't exactly know what, or the average member doesn't know exactly what's going on week in, week out with our church family. So I just want to give you a more or less mid-year church report, and then in just a moment, Brent Scott is going to lead us in a, a prayer on behalf of the things that God has done so far this year with our church family. I will let you know that what I'm about to tell you is it's, there's a really, really good webpage online that Kendra Orr built last week. It's mrcc.org slash 2020 midyear. It's got a lot more information than I'm about to give to you, so please go check that out. But uh, he, here's some of the things that we've done this year. Over the summer, our campus ministry made some kind of contact with 344 students over the summer. Our children's ministry put out 50 VBS boxes, so we took VBS to the neighborhoods, reaching hundreds of kids, both from our church family and the community. Celebrate Recovery and our international ministry have gone online. 150 teens uh, went to socially distanced church camp over the summer. Over 150 of our members traveled to Colorado last week for Summit. 75 young adults on average have been meeting each week throughout the summer for Bible study. Uh, back when, the, when COVID first broke out in the spring, we prepared a thousand meals for Orvis Reisner students, 800 care packages for elderly and medical professionals. We've seen 387 lighthouse patients. Uh, we've put out 2,000 Bible correspondence lessons per month for our prison ministry. In fact, there are 31 people waiting to be baptized right now in our prisons uh, once restrictions are lifted. We've had 100 counseling sessions. A thousand meals provided for doctors and nurses, three thousand five hundred masks made for OU Medical, and here's our big finish: six weddings, fourteen babies, forty baptisms, and a partridge and a pear tree. God has been really good to us, and we're grateful for the things He's done for us this year. And again, check check out more stories and 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 more information. MRCC.org/slash 2020 Midyear. Two more things to let you know about. One. Over the last six months, you have given $145,000 for COVID relief, especially for our own church family, as more and more of our members are dealing with the ramifications of this pandemic. And so, so far, we've helped 71 families in our church family with things like rent, utilities, food, health care. Uh, one person wrote this anonymously that we helped. He said, we lost our source of income due to COVID-19. It is sure powerful to know that we're not alone. God care, God's care for us has flowed through our church family. And one final thing I'll mention before Brent uh, uh, leads our prayer is that several of you have asked uh, various staff and elders, how are we doing contribution-wise? Well, at the beginning of the pandemic, to be honest, we were, we were pretty nervous about that contribution. But you as a church family have been absolutely phenomenal for the last six months. We are making... 91% of our budget for this calendar year. So we need to give glory and praise to God for that. I would encourage you to 
uh, keep being generous and, and just be mindful that ministry is happening. I'll also let you know that we're being really, really prudent and careful behind the scenes and spending less than, than what is given. So we're, we're being good stewards of the money you're, you're blessing the church with. I said this six months ago. I read this in one of the first emails I got about COVID, but I'll end by saying this. Church has not been canceled. The church has been deployed. Brent, will you come lead us in a prayer? Our Holy Father in heaven, there are so many things that we want to talk to you about today, but Father, we first ask that you will just listen to us. We find comfort in the fact that you long to hear us. God, we first want to thank you for the love that you have showered upon us abundantly, Father. God, we thank you for the grace that you freely give us, Father. We pray that we will accept that grace, Father, but more importantly, Father, we pray that we will extend that grace and that mercy to others. Father, we are living in uncertain times. We know that these times are not new to you. We know that when we seek you, when we ask you, that you will provide answers, Father. Father, I pray that we will live radical lives I pray, Father, that our love will be radical. I pray, Father, that our forgiveness will be radical. God, I pray that we will always see your creation through your eyes, Father, that we will never pass judgment, Father. Father, that we will be image bearers of you, Father. We want to thank you right now for the parents that will be dropping their children off at college. We want to thank you for their trust. God, I pray that during this time that you will give them peace and comfort, Father. God, I pray that you will allow them to know that they have a community here that will love their children. That is, we help them develop a more intimate relationship with you, that they also will help us and challenge us. Father, we want to pray right now for our students. We want to pray for our school boards, for our teachers, for the administrations, for all those who will be making decisions, Father, for this upcoming year. God, I pray that you'll just simply give them wisdom that comes from heaven. I pray, Father, that you will continue to give them peace and comfort and courage, Father. God, I pray that you will relieve any anxiety that all of us may have with this upcoming school year, Father, but just realize as we stay focused on you, that you will always provide. Father, we want to continue to pray for the Harmons. God, I pray for Bob and for Karen and for their children. God, I pray for those who are still uh, caring for Bob. God, I pray that you will give them an extra level of compassion. Give them words to comfort the family, Father. Father, I pray that we will always have our minds controlled by your spirit in all that we do. We pray all this in your son's most powerful name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brent. Earlier this summer, I, I did a series on the church called Beyond a Building, and we looked at metaphors for the church, and there was one metaphor I didn't get to do. So I'm going to finish that series today before we start our new series uh, called Reimagine Next Week. Uh, We'll start with this question. On a scale of 1 to 10, and you can show your neighbor or show me by your fingers, uh, how angry of a person are you? 10 being you fly off the handle very easily, 0 being you're very, very calm. Just show your neighbor some fingers. How angry are you as a person? 10, 9. Is anybody a 10? Can you just raise your hand if you're a 10? You want to admit that? Thank you. I appreciate that. So... When people who are normally calm get angry, it's actually really important to pay attention why they got angry. So one person in my life that's like a zero on the anger scale is my dad. Super calm, n nothing ruffles his feathers. I, I can think of very, very few times in, in my life where he has raised his voice. But I will tell you one. I was five years old. I was in the back seat. 
we were leaving somewhere, and my dad was driving, and he asked, is everybody buckled? I was not buckled yet, but I had good intentions to buckle. I was definitely going to buckle. So I just responded, yeah, Dad, I, I'm buckled, thinking, yes, I will do this in just a few seconds. Well, for whatever reason, he actually turned around and looked at me and saw that I was not buckled, and oh, man, my dad let me have it. I, I buckle now because of that moment in my life. And parents, if you need someone to talk to your kids about buckling, you need to talk to my dad. When calm people get angry, you got to ask, why are they so angry? And for my dad, he had every reason to be angry because he was trying to protect me and keep me safe. One of the most interesting stories in the Bible is the day that Jesus got angry. You normally think of Jesus as being a pretty calm guy. Well, there was a day when he went into a public space where people were buying and selling animals, and he lifts these tables up and turns them over. The money clangs all over the floor. He walks over to, to some cages, and he lets these animals out, and he gets a whip, and he starts beating the animals out of this place. In other words, Jesus is defacing public property. Now, if you're a Christian, you know this story, and you think, oh, yeah, well, he got good reason to do this. But if you had actually been there when it originally happened, you would not have said, oh, this makes a lot of sense. If you had been there when this originally happened, you would have said, what's he doing? What has got into him? What has possessed him? Somebody needs to stop Jesus from behaving like a lunatic. When calm people get angry, you got to ask the question, why is he so angry? And so why is Jesus angry in this moment? It has everything to do with where Jesus is standing. Jesus is standing in the temple, and it is very difficult for us moderners to comprehend the magnitude of the temple to ancient people. So I will attempt to, to explain how significant it was for just a few minutes here. If you could take the Supreme Court building, the White House, and the most famous church building in the world and somehow put that into one building, that would be the temple for ancient people. It was the center of national life. It was the center of political life. It was the center of their spiritual life. It was the center of their judicial practice. Most of the life of Israel centered around the temple. In fact, I want to give you three reasons why the temple was so significant. And I got to be honest, I wrote this sermon and I was reading over this sermon and thinking, this is one of those sermons that like, if I was listening to it, I'd want to go back and look up some of the Bible verses later. It's, it's a lot of Bible. So we're just going to plow through it quickly. So, so bear with me here. First reason I want to put forth to you why the temple was so important is that the temple is actually Israel's narrative high point. And so what I mean by that is when you think about the Old Testament narrative, mainly Genesis, Exodus, which tell, tell the primary narrative of Israel, the most iconic scene is probably the Red Sea, but that's not the pinnacle moment. The, the ultimate climax, peak moment, narrative high point of Israel's uh, of story is actually at the end of Exodus when God builds the tabernacle, which is the forerunner to the temple. And so here's how this, actually I'll read the very last verse of Exodus. The final verse of Exodus says this, the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day. And fire was in the cloud by night in the sight of all the Israelites during their travels. In other words, the whole story of, of creation, fall, Abraham, Moses, it all ends with God building a place to come dwell with his people. That's the narrative high point, tabernacle, forerunner to temple. Here's a second reason why the temple was so significant. Missional architecture. In fact, just to keep you engaged here, if you're in the parking lot or if you're at home, say missional architecture. So, so here's what I mean by that. If you go and read how the temple was designed, and by the way, God did not delegate the temple design. He actually was the primary architect. And, and here's how the, the building was built. We're starting in the middle. You got this incredible room. It's called the Holy of Holies. It's 30 feet by 30 feet by 30 feet. It's a perfect cube. You've got the Ark of the Covenant in there. You've got the statues of angels in there. But even more importantly than that, this room is where the presence of God dwelt. So in this perfect cube room, you don't have the, the image of God. You don't have just the people of God. You don't have God mediated through something else. You have God, the being 
the presence of God himself is in this holy of holy space. And then what's amazing is that the Holy of Holies affects the larger building, which is just called the Holy Place, and that's where the leaders of Israel go. And then that affects the courtyard, which is about the size of four football fields, and that's where a lot of the common people go. And then beyond that's the rest of the world. So think about the architecture here. You've got God resting in the middle, and then he influences the leaders, and the leaders influence the people, and the people influence the world. So this one building, the temple has within it God's plan of how he wants to save the whole world. This is God's plan of Genesis 12. I'm going to bless Abraham. Abraham's going to bless the world. It's that promise designed in a building. That's how significant the temple was. It was God's missional architecture to reach the world. Third reason, and you're going to have to go look this one up because I'm I'm just going to plow through this one quickly. The temple was the recreation of the Garden of Eden. There's a lot of both Christian and Jewish scholars which are pointing this out these days. There are so many parallels between temple and Eden. So, for example, number one, temple uh, or Eden creation takes seven days to make. Temple takes seven years. An angel guards the Garden of Eden. Angels in the temple. You have a tree in the Garden of Eden. You have a carving of a tree in the temple, 1 Kings 6. God walks among Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. God walks among the temple. Leviticus 26. Adam and Eve are tasked to be the primary caretakers of the Garden of Eden. The priests are tasked to be the primary caretakers of the temple. And then finally, I'll say this. Creation ends with Sabbath. The creation of the temple also ends with Sabbath. The Sabbath regulations in Exodus chapter 31. Now, I know that was a mouthful. That's a lot to take in. But here's the main idea. The temple is God's ultimate dream for the world. Just like Eden... In the temple, God says, I will give you my presence, and then through that presence, you will bring wholeness and life and beauty for the whole world. Now, for our purposes, why are we going to all this big Bible study about the temple? Here's why I went through all that background to say this. This is why Jesus was so angry. It's because these religious leaders had come into the temple, which was supposed to be God's model to reach the whole world, and they had made it for their own purposes. So in other words, here's what was happening in the day that that Jesus turned the tables over. The religious leaders were going through the motions of the temple, and they had neglected the mission of the temple. Going through the motions of the temple meant that you would just buy and sell animals. You, You would turn it into a marketplace. But the mission of the temple was, that, was to bring God to the world and, to the, and the world to God. This is where Israel had simply failed. In fact, this failure was so significant that Jesus' cleansing of the temple was really just the first stage of a larger judgment of the temple. So first, Jesus walks in, he turns over the tables. Second, when Jesus dies on the cross, you can answer this question here, what was torn in half while Jesus was on the cross? The curtain of the temple that separated the holy place from the, ho- the most holy place, that was torn in two while Jesus was on the cross. This is another way of God saying, the temple has failed. But then thirdly, Jesus predicted when he was on the earth that a day would come when the temple would be destroyed, and it happened. About 30 years after Jesus went back into heaven, a pagan nation comes in and they desecrate the temple. They destroy it. They take it off stone by stone. They burn it and leave it in a rubble. And again, it is so hard for us moderners to fathom how the ancient people would have felt when the temple was destroyed. In fact, the only way I can even think to compare it to is can you imagine if you woke up tomorrow morning and every monument in Washington, D.C., and the White House itself, and every church building in our country were burned to the ground Can you imagine the collective despair and depression we would feel? That's close to what ancient Israel would have felt when the temple was destroyed. But here's the crazy part. The story, it does not stop there. So Paul, he writes something which I think that many people in his day would have thought blasphemous. But it was absolutely radical. He writes this in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 3. He says this. Do you not know that you are the temple and that the Holy Spirit dwells in you? I'm going to read that verse again. Do you not know that you are 
the temple. You're the temple. And the Holy Spirit dwells in you. So what does this mean? Let's put this all together. The temple is the place through which God reaches the world. The temple is the place through which God reaches, reaches the lost and the foreigner and the lonely and the poor. All people come to God. God wants to reach all people through the place of the temple. But Calvary marks a radical shift in the location of the temple. It's no longer a building. It's a body. It's a person. You're the temple. I'm the temple. In fact, if you're in the parking lot, turn to your neighbor and say, you are the temple. If you're at home, turn to someone sitting on the couch next to you and say, you're the temple. Now, guys, this, this is a, a radical idea here because of how significant this was. And so here's, here's where all this is boiling down to. It's boiling down to a, I want to ask you a few questions here. I want you to dial back in. If you're distracted, kind of come back in with me here. I, I want to ask you a few questions about this. Jesus is in the business of temple evaluation. So here's the question. What do you think that Jesus would say if he evaluated your stewardship of his temple? Like in other words, would Jesus come down into your life and praise you and say, yes, way to go. This is exactly what my father and I envisioned when we change the location of the temple from a building to a person, and the way that you live your life, it, it brings honor and glory to me and my Father. Is that how Jesus would evaluate your stewardship of his temple? Or do you think he would rebuke you for turning his temple into a shopping mall, or into a bank, or into a bar? In other words, what I'm saying is, do you think that Jesus would grieve because you've made your entire life about consumerism and about money and about pleasure or here let me flip it the question one more way and the way i'm going to flip the question now is i i am stepping on toes a little bit today but i'm going somewhere with this but let me ask the question one more way and again this is just self-reflection just think about your own spiritual life do you think that right now in your life you are going through the motions of church or would you consider yourself engaged in the mission of the church there's a big difference Going through the motions of the church means that you show up, you attend, sing a few songs, listen to a sermon, give a little bit. That's the motions of church, but that's not the mission of the church. The mission of the church is for you and I to bring the presence of God to the world. So are you more engaged in going through the motions of the church or are you engaged in the mission of the church? The motions of the church primarily happen on Sundays. And the mission of the church primarily happens Monday through Saturday. So what do you think? Are you a mission person or are you a motion person? Now, I know I'm pushing here. I'm, it, I hope this is challenging. It's challenging for me. I'm stepping on my own toes even as I say these words. But I don't just want to step on toes today. I want to give you shoes. And so I'm going to go to one more section of this sermon. And I actually, this, of, of my study, this is the part that blew me away. I want to give you actually five ways that you can be the temple right now. I went back and read Solomon's prayer when he dedicates the temple on the day it was actually created. So God, temple's made, Solomon stands up and gives this prayer. And in this prayer, we learn five things, five characteristics that God originally wanted in his own temple. So I'm just going to read verses, and then I want you to evaluate if these things are in your life. Here, here we go. First, these are all in 1 Kings 8. Starting in verse 30, Solomon says this, God, hear from heaven your dwelling place, and when you hear from the temple, forgive. The first pillar of the temple is forgiveness. Verse 32 of, of 1 Kings 8, Solomon says this, Judge between your servants, condemning the guilty by bringing down on their heads what they have done, and vindicating the innocent by treating them in accordance with their innocence. Second feature of the temple mission is justice. We've got forgiveness. We've got justice. Number three, verse 36, teach them the right way to live. Holiness. We've got forgiveness. We've got justice. We've got holiness. Number four is probably going to throw some of you off. Verse 36, Solomon prays this. God, would you send rain on the land? 
that you gave to your people for an inheritance. Fourth pillar of the temple is ecological blessing. You see, the temple of God was not only supposed to bless the people, it was supposed to bless the planet. So we've got forgiveness, we've got justice, we've got holiness, we've got ecological blessing. Here's number five, verse 42 and 43. When they, as in the foreigner, when they come to this place and they pray to the temple, then hear from heaven your dwelling place and do whatever the foreigner asks of you. So what are we going to do when the Egyptians come? And what are we going to do when the Persians come? And what are we going to do when, when, when the Amalekites, heaven forbid, come to the temple? We're going to include them. That's the fifth pillar of the temple. It's inclusion. So you've got forgiveness, you've got justice, you've got holiness, you've got ecological blessing, and you have inclusion. And then here's how the prayer ends, and I love this part. So kind of, we're wrapping up. We're getting close to the end here, but stay with me. Here's how Solomon ends his prayer. He says, the reason we do all these things is this. So that all peoples on earth may know your name. That is why we practice these principles, is so that the world can come to know God. So here's my five questions for you. As you think about your own life, how Jesus would evaluate your stewardship of his temple, which is your body, here's my five questions. Number one, who do you need to forgive? Question number two, who do you need to fight for? Like, how are you going to practice justice? Question number three, who do you need to include? Question number four, how can you be holy? And question number five, how can you care for creation. Those are the five pillars of the temple. And let me say this. That was the mission of the temple. I also think it's the mission of the church, but here's the big difference between the mission of the temple and the mission of the church. The temple was built and the message was come to us. The temple was a destination. The church is not a destination. The church is a movement. We don't just assemble and hope that the world comes to us. We are called to go to the world. Jesus says, as, or God says, I, or Jesus says to his apostles, as, I have sent, or as, as God has sent me, so I am sending you. The temple was a destination. The church is a movement. Here's the final passage I'll read to you. Revelation 21. John looks up and he sees this final vision. It's the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. And this angel comes and measures the new city. So this is the moment when it's the end of time. Heaven and earth are now coming together in this new, beautiful, sinless, deathless form of creation. And John's writing down what he sees. And so this new Jerusalem is coming down. And this angel comes and measures the city. And here is what the angel says. or the, uh, Revelation 21. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length and as wide and high as it is long. That's kind of a weird measurement. If you translate it into into our terms, it'd be 1,400 miles. And if you just put that on a map, it'd be about half the size of the U.S. That's weird. Why would the New Jerusalem come down and be that size? Is John in the Bible trying to say, well, heaven's going to be half the size of the U.S.? No, that's not what it's trying to say. There's so much metaphor in Revelation. So think about this, guys. It's 12,000 by 12,000 by 12,000. That's a perfect cube. There are only two places in the Bible where there's a perfect cube. One is in the Holy of Holies. And the second is in the new heavens and in the new earth. So what's Scripture trying to tell us? What Scripture is trying to tell us here is that what happened in the Holy of Holies back then, where the glory of God was radiated into this space, that is now at the end of time going to happen to the entire world. And so the whole new creation will be absolutely full of the presence and magnificence and glory of God. Another way of saying this would be that everything we've known to this point is a sprinkling of God's presence. But one day we will be baptized into the glory of God, the whole creation, the whole planet. That's where we're going, and it's the church's job to lead the way to that end. It's our job. We're the new Adams. We're the new Eves called to steward this planet. We are the new priests called to steward the temple. We are the Christians called to further the message of Jesus for the sake of the world. So the way we're going to end is I'd like you to go ahead and stand, please. 
I'm simply going to read the prayer from Solomon the day that he dedicated the temple. Here's what Solomon said in his prayer. So if you bow your heads, we'll end with this prayer. God, may your eyes be open towards this temple day and night. This place of which you say, my name shall be there. Uphold the cause of your servant according to each day's need. So that all people of the earth may know that the Lord is God. And that there is no other. Father, help us to be people of forgiveness and justice and holiness and ecological blessing and inclusion so that the whole world may know you and your son Jesus. In his name we pray and everybody said, amen.